Miss Joanna A. Ashite. Oh, Ashile. Yeah. Miss Joanna A. Ashile. Okay, anyway. To do the introduction of the keynote speaker. Please um, help me with the name here. Yeah? Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, my mouth cannot hold the words put together of such an immaculate father. He had his education at the Amankwetia Experimental Basic uh, School, Kumasi. He proceeded to Opokuwari School in Kumasi, where he gained his GCE Ordinary and Advanced Level Certificates. He proceeded to Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, where he graduated with a Bachelor of Science, Social Sciences in English and Law. In 2003, he gained admission to the Ohio University in Athens to pursue a Master of International Affairs program. In Ohio, Athens, he was the graduate assistant as well and subsequently a teaching assistant. That same year, he got admitted into a doctoral program in the School of Media Arts and Studies at the Scripps College of Communication in the same institution to read a PhD in mass communication and graduated in 2009. He was employed as a lecturer in the Department of Communication and Media Studies as, at the University of Education in, uh, in 2010. He was appointed as um, the graduate coordinator, subsequently as the director of externally funded projects. He went on to become the dean of the faculty of foreign languages education. In our prestigious university, he has served on several high-ranking boards and committees, including the Academic Board, the Appointments and Promotions Board, the Executive Committee, the Graduates Board, the Strategic Plan Development Com Committee, and the Strategic Plan and Monitoring Committees. He is also a representative of the Journalism and Communication Training Institutes in Ghana, institution, institutions in Ghana. He is a member of several professional associations, such as the National Media Commission, the International Communication Association, the International Association of Media Communication and Research the Association of Educators in Journalism and Mass Communication, and the Africa Studies Association, Africa. At the Department of Communication and Media Studies, he is a lecturer of um, communication theory, development communication, research methods and communication. He is very passionate about teaching and sees the profession to be his core to serve Ghana and mankind. He is passionate about mentoring and socializing with his students, as well as having intellectual discourses with them. He is also a strong gender advocate and likes to be referred to as a feminist. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my presentation will be in the form of, I'm not going to read a speech. Uh, so I don't know how they're going to project for me so that I can talk about whatever I want to say. But even as they try to get everything up there. I want to make some preliminary remarks. First, I realized that I have been given uh, 40 minutes to do the presentation, which by my 
nature is highly inadequate. So I'll see how I'll cram that and going by the topic into everything into 40 minutes. Second, and most importantly, I'm very serious about this remark that I'm making. In the last few years, we have worked very, very hard to mainstream gender ideas on this campus and this university. When Dr. Obapenyi asked me whether I would present, I was a bit hesitant because in 2018, we said our theme was we are pressing forward. And when we press forward, we don't press forward and press back. We press forward and forward and forward. In 2013, I came here in 2010. 2013, I had the opportunity of being invited by the now acting registrar, Ms. Mina Tete Mensa, and some other colleagues, including Oba Penny, Dr. And then I, when I made them aware that I'm interested in gender issues and feminist issues. So from that time, I've been part of almost all programs that have been organized. And between 2017, let me say between 2015 and 2021, a lot went into making sure that gender and feminist, or let me say gender ideas, were mainstreamed so many programs were, were, were organized, and I became the number one advocate of gender issues on campus. Now, fortunately for me, I had opportunity of becoming part of management, and I thought that that opportunity was also my biggest window to make sure that women were given access to top positions in this university. We made a lot of progress. By 2021, December, out of seven, out of nine faculty deans, seven of them were women. Seven. Now, I had issues with, with the director of gender at that time because I couldn't understand how, of all the universities in the world, UW was the only university that has seven female deans, and yet we didn't make any noise about it. It was not in the newspapers, it was not on radio, nowhere. And yet, there was nowhere you, you could go in the world that you could pick an university where out of nine deans, second of them. So I asked, what are you doing? Are we making pro progress or we are just retreating? Then, we have lost all of them. Now, out of the seven deans, there are only two. So are we making progress or are we going back? Because some of us lobbied strongly, believing that when women are at the helm of leadership, there's much progress than when men are, men are at the helm of leadership. Some of us strongly believe that women are more principled than men when we give them leadership position. So I lobbied and lobbied and lobbied and gradually made some headway. That's why we had seven. Whether they came through APB interview or by appointment, we had seven. And I was looking forward to the day that we'll have our first vice chancellor female. Then another thing happened. We were going for convocation elections. And two of our ladies decided to contest. And I was of high hope that out of the four positions, at least one would be ours. We went to the pools, and our women even didn't vote for the men. For the women, our own women. In fact, I had issue with one person who even said nobody could campaign on women's platform, gender platform. You are there are two women who are campaigning, and you prevent them from campaigning on their own platform. So when you bring a here, you say gender, gender, gender. Why should you take it serious? I said. Your own platform, you have created a gender platform, and two women are from your own group are campaigning for position as convocation rep. We need four members. And then they post their campaign messages there, and then it's taken out, taken down by another woman. Why? You can't campaign on that platform. My God. So, what were you doing all these years? 
Why shouldn't I be sitting in my corner somewhere and smoking my something? <laughs> you see, so when I look at all that and they say, come and speak, and I have been a speaker every year since 2017. Every year I'm here, every year I'm here. So when they said I should come, I said, oh, come where? I didn't know you now, I didn't know you I didn't know you now. And it seems some of us are weeping more than they breathed. The women are here. Even as we, today is the National Women's Day, we are here having this event. There's another group, women, something, something, they're also having that. that. The women are not even coordinating. So why would the men say you are your own, own enemies? Instead of coming, now we are here, there's another group of women in STEM. So women in STEM, it shouldn't be part of international, the same event, the same time. And so management have to divide themselves. Do some go here, some come there. You see, men will not do that. And that's why men will always dominate women. So if you have given me 40 minutes, I will speak 40 minutes for you. <laughs> but just to let you know that women should bind together. And know that if you, it is only when you come together that you get what you have, what you want. Because... It doesn't make sense that we have a big day like this, and when I even heard that, you see, I said, hey, so now we are even going to diminishing returns. We always had it at Anamwa, now we can't even have it there. I think next time it will be some classroom, 70 theater classroom. We are going until we go to a, 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 a taxi rank somewhere, small place, and they will do it. Please, women, fight. Fortunately, you have a vice chancellor whose wife is a dean. Lobby, you use those, use those to lobby. You have this program, you use her to lobby. There are going to be appointments that are going to be made in July. Please lobby for women. Don't sit there like that. People lobby. We lobby. All the appointments that came, it was through lobbying. And there's nothing wrong with lobbying. So, on that note, <laughs> I want to start my presentation. But and I also acknowledge that okay, all right. Quite it. Let's say all right. This one is for if I want to go up and down. I also want to say, add that, despite all that I've said, I also understand that in trying to push for gender advocacy and gender mainstreaming, there are challenges. And I think that whatever we have gone through or has happened will be some of the challenges that we face. And we need to press forward. We need to go ahead. We need to, and we have said that it is, if we want this country to develop, we must carry our women along. There's no country in the world that has developed by leaving its women behind. And we can never, never make any progress if we do that. So please let us continue to forge ahead and fight. I'm also glad to see that there are a lot of men here. But more especially, I want to again recognize Mrs. Judy Micah, who has been with us the um, Director of Education here in Ifutu. She has been with us every time that we have had this event. I, I can't remember the last time that she, I came here and she was around. So, Madam, and then the PRO, we welcome you to the special one. Thanks so much for joining us. Please make sure that you initiate gender advocacy in your, in your area uh, so that when we come, we we'll be proud that you came here, you took the message, and it's working. All right. Now, I am going to speak on bridging the gender gap through technology and innovation. Unfortunately, I saw that my topic and Dr. Ananga's topic look almost the same. So, Doc, if I go to a slide, you can, you can say, aha, how many of you are here? Then I will just skip that one. Because when I look, I say, ah, maybe by the time I'm done, she will not have anything to say. 
That's why they gave me 40 minutes, so that maybe I'll skip. All right. Now, we have had a lot of discussions in gender and gender, gender equality, gender equity, gender equality, gender equity. But every year we have to do that because new crop of students come, new people uh, come on board, gender ideas are not easily assimilated. We need to make sure that everybody understands what we are talking about and we can assimilate it. Now, I'm going to... I don't know whether anybody can even see from there. The whole thing seems to be messed up. All right. Okay, so quick, a quick um, idea about gender uh, as an outward expression of what society considers male and female or masculine and, or feminine. Now, when you say we are doing gender, we are talking about the fact that whatever you do, we say you are a man, go and work. You are a woman, stay at home. Because everything there has been... Everything there, we say, we have constructed it. So when we talk about social construction, we say that gender is socially constructed. It means that society makes what is gender. They make it, they build it, they create it, they form it. And so because we have formed gender, we can also destroy gender. Because gender is based on what we say you have to do based on your sex. Now, gender is not sex, but because we say you are a woman, you have to be the nursing or you have to do babysitting. In fact, something that a man can also do, we say that's your gender role. So there are roles. And we need to understand how gender issue or gender is formed because gender asks you to do something by society. Society says, do this or do that. That's your gender. But again, gender is also spatially bound in the sense that gender changes from one place to the other. What is gender, gender performance in one area may not be the same. So that if you go to um, Saudi Arabia, men go to the market, women stay at home. But if you come here, it's the reverse. If you go to the northern part of Ghana in some areas, I've stayed there for about seven years. Now, sometimes a man is not supposed to go to the kitchen. For some in-laws, it's abominable to see their sons in the kitchen when the woman is there. But if you come to the south and you go to the market and you are cooking, they call you bemena. Why are there? Oh, bema with the no, be our you know, all those things. Those are gender issues. So gender is performed from one place to the other. Then we have the essence of what we are supposed to talk about is whether we can use technology and digitalization to bring gender equality. So I'll quickly talk about gender equality. Um, and as you can see there, it says, it denotes women having the same opportunities in life as men, including the ability to participate in the public sphere. Now, gender equality just means that we are all human beings, men and women. When there are opportunities, let us all have access to the same opportunities. Don't take the men to school and leave the women behind. It means that you are giving the men opportunities and leaving the women behind. So anytime there are opportunities, let us all have equal access to those opportunities. That's all. So it refers to all human beings developing their personal abilities, making life choices without the limitations set by stereotypes, rigid rules and prejudices. So here, we are saying that, now when we talk about gender equality, now whatever choices that you make, whatever abilities that anybody has, and whatever choices, we should be able to have those things without any limitation. Now, if I am a woman, you can't say that as a woman, I can't propose to a, a, a man, but a man can propose to me. You are limiting my choices. So some women will stay there forever, they can't propose, and therefore they will be single. And some men will have more than one because they, because they can propose. You are denying me equal opportunity. You can't say that because I'm a woman, I can't do science, or I can't do economics. All the time I say that when they take 
case to school, especially in secondary school, uh, they say, oh, economics is a very challenging and difficult subject, and so men should do it. Then the women were crying, oh, we'll do economics, we'll do economics. They say, okay, 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 you, you men, you keep quiet. If you do economics, we know you, you are in the home, so we'll add home. And then women are now doing home economics. <laughs> yes, you said you wanted economics, eh? They said, okay, you wait. We'll add something so that it can be economics for you. So home economics. You, are, you have limited their choices. You are not creating equal opportunities. And that's what gender equality seeks to do. It says open opportunity for all of us. If you say a master's program, let us all go and do the master's program. Don't add only men, admit men and leave women. No. You are creating inequalities. And that's something. If you come to my department, there are more women than men. I think it's good. Because we made conscious effort to admit women. And if you make that, that conscious effort, you see that the women would outperform the men. And in that department, School of Communication and Media Studies, we have had three students who have had 4.0 GPA, I'm sorry, the master's level. So they had A, 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 including dissertation A, and two of them are women. In fact, the first person to have a 4.0 in that department was the lady. The second, the man, the third. So we don't limit them. We give them equal opportunities. And if you give them equal opportunities, they will outperform the men. And the nation will develop faster. So if you say gender equality, then we say that we should have equal access to control. Now, we control this university. Recently, I don't know whether, uh, uh, Doc, you were there. We were at the academic, academic board in forming, co forming committees. Before we realized all the committees were male. All the committees, APB, male, APC, committees that deal with people's appointment and promotion. There's no woman there. Better than I will about the too. Who will speak for the women? So it means the men control, but we are saying that let, let, let them have equal access for control, power over resources. We are all trying to control resources. Equality will ensure that we all have such equal access to control, equal access to power. Then decision making. Let us all come together, men and women, to make decisions. And then when there are benefits from the resources, from our decision, Everybody, men and women, should have access. Now, in this country, contracts are given to men, and contractors make a lot of money. You don't hear about female contractors. When the last time you heard that somebody, a woman, is a contractor? Because there's no equal access to resources. So the moment you say contractor, then, oh, contractor number, you, are, you expect to see a man, and you go, it's a man. The same way that Previously, we say, oh, a professor will come and speak, and then in your mind, the professor is a man. Then, when the person comes and is a woman, say, hey, say, oh, you're bad. <laughs> but you never say, hey, say, oh, you're bad. You see, those are the things that we're talking about. We are saying that let us have equal access to these resources, and that's what gender equality is about. Now, gender equality, therefore, denotes that men and women should should or must become this. That's not you know that men and women should be the same. We are not saying we should be the same, no. If we, were, we are the same, it means that you get pregnant for a half month and then the man too should have be pregnant for a half month. No, that's not what we, are, what we are saying. We are saying that it means their rights, responsibilities, and opportunities will not depend on whether they are born male or female. It means that you don't look at my anatomy to determine what I should get in life. That's what we are saying. We are not saying, but when, if there are opportunities, give them the same opportunities. If there are rights, let them all have the same rights. If there are responsibilities, let them all have the same responsibilities and opportunities. Now, if there are opportunities for further studies, for uh, 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 PhD program, men and women should be treated equally. And not because you think that somebody 
is better than the other because of the sex or the makeup. Okay, I'll stick the next. Now, let me come to what we are supposed to discuss for today. And gender technology and the digital era. Now, let me indicate that we are all seeing how technology has become an integral part of our lives. To the extent that these days, living offline is a very difficult aside. Almost everybody has I see their own phone. You can see them. Two minutes to check your phone. Some of us don't even have the six hours sleep because all the time we are checking the phone and want to see something, you say, hey, let me respond. People are sending messages 3 a.m., 3 a.m., uh, um, 1 a.m., 2 a.m. They are not sleeping. In this world, you need digital skills to be in business. In our daily life, we are all in the digital world. Now, so I think the question we are asking here is whether we can use those avenues to bring gender equality. We'll see whether it, it, it can work or not and what lies ahead of us. Now, it even became more imperative during COVID-19 when we realized that even the school that we are attending, we have to go online. You want to buy things, you have to go online. Many businesses shut down and move online to operate those businesses. That is when it became clear that we can't escape the digital environment. Now, if that's the case, then it means that we need to ask ourselves whether equality is bridging, uh, technology is bridging the gap now or is widening it. Because already, there was that digital divide between men and women. And we were hoping that once COVID-19 came, all women would run and get the digital skills. Unfortunately, you realize that it's not so. But what can we do about it? So, if you want to participate in the global economy, if you want to do any business, we need to be in the digital world. And that is what we want to find out, whether our gender permits us to be more skillful with technology or not. Now, studies have shown that Gender gap is widening related to access to technology and digital inclusion. That one is there. If you, a lot of the studies will, let you, will tell you that, no, the gender gap is widening. Now, every time something new is coming, men rush to learn and women stay behind. Women have become laggards when it comes to um, technology and dig digital acquisition. It means that they are laggards and they are the last. When everybody has acquired the skill, then they go and find out whether it's working. They say it's working, then please teach me. And so, we have a lot of studies that show that, you know, that the gap has widened. And then, gender difference in digital access, participation in the digital economy is also widening. Now, in other words, when we, come, we talk about the digital era, Women are far behind. Men have advanced. And every day, even though you are using your cell phone, even though you are on social media, you think that you are in No, you are not. Because all that you are using it for, especially women, is for gossip. <laughs> and for hooking up. And for material acquisitions. Not for knowledge. Not to challenge oppression not to bring equality. And that is what we are talking about, that we have not become visible in the digital era, we are so marginalized. And it's important that we look at it. More women than men miss out of learning and, and economic opportunity because of lack of access to their digital devices. Now, you see, when, because we are in the digital era, Everybody is moving to that forum to learn and to do business. And more men are going there. And women are left behind because women are waiting for men to go and do their business and bring their money. 
Women are not taking the initiative to start their own businesses. Of course, it changes a bit. These days, uh, even in Winneba here, I see that a lot of the young ladies buy their stuff online. And somebody will bring from Accra and deliver at, not on campus, though, at the Lloyd Station. That's where they go and collect it. Because you have not used your data skills to indicate this is my location. You don't even know that you can use that to indicate location. But the point is that men are way ahead. And, but there are opportunities that we need to take advantage of. Because women lack access to digital devices. Every time women are looking up to men to buy them the devices. Because the men are in business. And they are all just observers. And if you are observing, you can make money. So we need to understand why this becomes important. Now, I've used the expression or the acronym CND to mean technology and digitalization. I'm going to make a case why women can be here, even though they are not there. Because sometimes we make statements like, oh, a women, they don't like technology, they don't like science. Oh, they don't like this area. And so they are there. I'm going to make a case. Then I'll look at the opportunities that arise. Then finally, I'll bring on board the idea that our whole conversation is going to be changed by artificial intelligence. In fact, it's a new thing. And so I'm going to encourage the women to go there because very soon, social media and all those things, oh, nobody will talk about them again. So we need to be introduced to those things. Now, why do we think that women can be at the forefront or rub shoulders with men? Because now women are breaking the glass. Glass ceiling. Glass ceiling is that literature that you see the ceiling up there, and through it you can see the men. You can see the men up there on the next floor. But women previously couldn't go there. Now they've broken it, they are there. They are rubbing shoulders, they are standing shoulder to shoulder with men. Now there are a lot of professors here. Now we have a lot of female professors, we didn't used to have them. And when I mentioned, it, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, at one time we had seven deans. That showed that, and the men were marginalized, and I was so happy that the men were marginalized. My, my happiness didn't last. And now I'm sad. But the point is that women have broken their glass ceiling, which means that if you introduce them to TND, they will come on board. We need to get that in mind. That is not the same as before. Now they stand at a position where they can actually get on board and get the TND skill. The women's sense of empathy. Now, you see, we shouldn't confuse women being emotional with women being empathetic. Now, women are by nature empathetic. And when they are even showing empathy, we say they are emotional. Because we men, we are not empathetic. We think about ourselves. We never put ourselves in the other person's place. Now, the moment women are able to come to the mainstream technology and digital world, we'll see that it is easy for us to be there. They will train others. They will cheat others. Now, they will not be pompous. They will be excited to bring others on board. And so they will make technology and the digital world affordable and approachable. We need to think about that. Then, studies have shown that wherever companies have included women in their technology and digital environment, profits have been higher. And not only that, they also realize that there's more inclusiveness in the decision making. So it means that we need to make a case for women that if we bring them on board, in fact, if we have women leaders, if we have women director of IT, instead of men, maybe by this time more women will be technologically savvy. Uh, Dr. Kwai, I, I'm, I'm preaching gender. So. <laughs> now, and the women, studies have also shown that women are very versatile when it comes to technology because why? They are able to manage, when a woman is there, they manage their career, they support the family, and they rise in leadership position using the little technology and data skills that they have. 
Now, we need to encourage more women to come on board because they can do these three things which men cannot easily do. Now, when it comes to rising in that position, we are hoping that every woman, wherever you work, you should be able to rise in that position. And getting the skill of technology and the family, it will allow you to manage your career. Because these days, a lot of work you have to do online, and you can stay at home. We are not looking at those opportunities. We want just to be in the service industry where every day we meet people face to face and then we serve them. Then, another reason we need to understand that women can be in TND is that no political reason for women to be less interested in TND. There's no. Nobody can tell us a woman's biology prevents her from reading science or technology or engineering or math. Now, that lack of interest is due to cultural and social influence. You see, the, 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 our idea that a woman cannot do this and that is because of all our own culture. Because we have, through patriarchy, intentionally, consciously, prevented women from entering certain areas. It's not because they have no interest there, because we kill the interest. So that saying that women are uninterested is a lazy argument. Because it prevents us from taking all the actions the thing that we have to do to bring women on board. Oh, the previous elections have been declared, you know, openly for, and what do you see? There's one woman, I've not seen her poster. So we say, oh, the woman is just not interested. It's not that she's not interested. Who, which woman would like to become a pro vice chancellor? If you're in the university, there are two top positions, the vice chancellor and the pro vice chancellor. And then you have nominated, you say you are not interested. No, because cultural influences. Because of social influences. Because otherwise, don't understand why for about three, four days now, how many days? Doc, how many days now since we, the, the elections were open? Last Friday, right? Yeah, I think almost one week. We have not seen her poster. Anything, let's see. The men are going out, please vote for me, vote for me, vote for me. I'll bring you manna from heaven. Because we will make the argument that she is not just in jail. Because we, have, we prevent ourselves from taking those actions, those things that we need to do to bring women on board, we fail to do that. And then we say they are just not interested. It's a lazy argument. If you're a woman and anybody tells you anywhere that, oh, a man, no, I'm not a man, 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 I'm not a not a man i am not a man i am not a not a man i am 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 not a man mechanism for them to be there. Now, we are also making the case that women are now on social media. And social media is a transformative tool. Everybody here is on social media. Now, social media has un unmuted the voices of women. Women couldn't speak. There are a lot of things women couldn't speak. Now, if you go, even Ghana here, look at uh, Lydia Fossey. That lady is always writing one thing or the other, challenging oppression. How? Through social media. Because women's voices had been muted and in, in, in public spaces they couldn't speak. But now through social media, women can even propose easily to men. You send the letter, you send some emojis, and then you know that, ah, they're alpha. So now they can say a lot of things, they can go online, and put their voices there, and we can hear them. So if they can be on social media, that requires some kind of skills and tech. Why can't they be in tech, TNG? We need to understand that. Now, and you see, women have also been very active. Social media activism has shown a lot of tangible results. The Me Too was started by women. A lot of the social media activism 
that we seen that had led to transformation in society were started by women, were initiated by women. And that shows that we can bring these two men on board because some men cannot even go on social media to create a group. But when women do that, we don't see it as a huge thing. The point is that women have the ideas and the skills and they can come on board. And we need to encourage them to do that. Now, again, women are denied opportunities and encounter more obstacles. Society kills their confidence at young age. There are a lot of ladies here, young ladies here, who wanted to read science, medicine, engineering. They kill them. Hey, oh, bad, 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 so, we society will kill the confidence of young at an early age. That prevents them from picking up C and D. And that thing stays with them all their life. And that's why, as society, we need to make sure that we boost up the confidence of young ladies and young girls. You know, and then society assumes that they are less capable. And the women have accepted that they are less capable. We say, oh, you, you are a woman, you can't do this. Ah, it's true. I'm a woman. You have, in, you live in your house. Your bulb is broken. There's a ladder there. There are chairs there. You pick a call. Crazy. What's wrong with you? Something simple that you can do because you say you are less capable, you can't do it. And you are waiting for somebody. Otherwise, you sleep in darkness. So we assume that we are less capable and it translates to our incapacity or inability to do things. We need to avoid that. Now, sometimes, you see, if a woman works um, in, in the, in the uh, Dr. Kray, do you have a lady working with you? In your, as a dictator, you see? Look at, when I ask her, I ask him, do you have a lady working with you, say, as a dictator? Is a dictator anti person? It's a zero here, and yet we are doing international women's day. We are talking about technology and bridging the gap when we have not bridged the gap here. We can't even build a bridge here in our own home. Why? Because when it comes to technology, we will go to even if there was a woman there and somebody we went there and say, Okay, my laptop uh, can't wait. Say, Okay, go to Rafik, go to Kelly. They will never mention the woman's name. Because we create that kind of idea in them that they are incapable and they assimilate it, they internalize it, and they live by it. It's not because women are wrong. You see, if you go there and you want to do gender mainstream, you move some of them and now, if I had the power and I'm doing interview, oh, if you're a man, you come, before you enter, you are failed. I'm looking for the woman. Because that is affirmative action. Affirmative policy means that you focus on giving the marginalized people more opportunities than those who are already in the mainstream. And so how can we have a whole IT directory and there's no woman there who is, who is doing TNG? So I wonder what Dr. Kwaebi is going to talk about today. <laughs> Data transformation supports women progressively. Now, you see, if we say that we are in the digital world and we are transforming, you realize that it opens avenue for economic and social empowerment. Now, women earn more income. Now, it's good to know that most of the online businesses, women are behind it. Most of the things women here buy online, there are women behind it. And it's good. It shows that women are taking advantage. And if we give them the opportunity, they will do more. Then, they are also getting employment. And when you have the digital skills, you have network opportunities. You can link up with a lot of people. Of course, uh, I understand that the other workshop or forum that's going out there was initiated by women. That's good. But my point is that we should have all come together to do one and later the other. We don't, if you separate, it's divide and rule. And that's not good for us. But at this forum, or at any technology and data environment, there's opportunity for you to network. And women have the opportunity to do that. Now, again, we have the opportunity to bring gender equality enablers. There are things that we do that enable gender equality. 
If we use TND, we can do those things better. For example, we can address gender biases and harmful social norms. And that's why I said, if we're nursing, uh, uh, um, Lydia Forsen, and other women have taken the platform, including all the notable journalists, and they're addressing those social needs. Some women who are working against gender issues. But if we take advantage of the, of the TND, that's what we can do. Then we, can, so we must also create supportive policies and training for women in technology and digitalization. If we don't consciously, intentionally set up what we call boot camps, bring women together and train them. And now that we are here, I'm hoping that very soon, Dr. Paedu will set up a boot camp for some of our ladies here to train them in technology and digitalization. <laughs> because after the end where I meet you, I'm going to ask why I started. Oh, yes, I did. So we need to understand that if we can create that support and supportive environment, everything will work. Now we have to implement targeted digital literacy. That's, that example is what I said. You target the women and you train them. You give them ideas. You give them a skill so that they can be mainstream into technology. Now we need to understand that we the men alone being technology savvy will never ever ever allow this country to grow. Because we are leaving 51% of the population behind. And 50% or 49% cannot take the country forward. Especially when they play a crucial role in our country. Now, there's what we call reciprocal group mentoring. This is very important for all the ladies here. Please, I want you to know this. Most of the time, what we need to do is that we need to bring together people of different, at different stages of their career. But, you see, we live in a world where interdisciplinary no knowledge is very crucial. We live in the world where we talk about intersectionality. If you are an engineer, engineering alone can never lead to societal progress. We need ideas from other places, from other disciplines. Now, when you create a mentoring group where people from different disciplines come together, then you can have a more power effect, powerful effect on society than when you do one-on-one. -on -one. So, it is not enough for me to say that Mrs. Deborah Apple is mentoring Mrs. Upon people. No, that will not work. That will not lead to progress. But when you open the group to include others, not only in administration, but from science, from whole economics, and you come together, you share ideas, then you know how you can use technology to promote your group. And you'll be, you'll be doing reciprocal group mentoring because I don't know everything. You don't know everything. I can teach you and you can teach me. You click those things. And then you explore new stuff. But I'm also very particular about start virtual hangout with men mentors and mentees. Virtual hangout means that you create online platform so that wherever the women are, you can hang out there. You don't have to go out and hang out somewhere, go and sit at uh, the stage and be drinking. That's where we are. You say we are hanging out and are mentioning. No. Most of the time, because women are at home, let us create that platform, whether by Zoom or by Skype or whatever method, and then hang out, share ideas. People are doing that elsewhere. We need to do that here. So the virtual hangout is very, very important. One person starts and brings other people on board. Now from all disciplines. And then they will give you perspective of what's happening in one discipline or the other. Now there, you can discuss your goals, you can share your successes and questions. You can even talk about things that are worrying you because you are in the group mentoring. You are mentoring each other within that group. So you can voice the pain that is in you. The thing that somebody have, people have done against you and somebody will give you advice. One-on-one -on -one is good, but it's not enough. So think about that. And through that process, you can also teach people how to use that, oh, I use this app, and it solved my problem for me. I use that app, that software, and that's, where that's when people get to know that TND 
is useful in life. Then set up a community of women with CND interests and share. Now, you, when you do the hangout, you can also create an online community. Community of people who are interested in learning technology and data issues. And then you put them, that is a community by itself. And then every day when you go there, all that you discuss are tech savvy issues. And then as people are able to use those things in their life, more will come on board. We need to think about it. If you're a young lady here, think about such a community. Don't only do association of the, the, the English students uh, uh, without thinking about technology. Please, it's important that we move with the world and not, not allow the world to move and leave us behind. Now, create a, a state, and when you create that community, that's where people can easily say things that they can't say. You have created a safe space, a very safe space where people can talk about issues. Women can talk about issues that worry them. And then you raise their aspiration. Then you inspire them. In that community, you inspire and then you raise people's aspiration. And then you see that once you do that and you center everything on te technology, you will be bridging the equality gap. There are things that you have learned over the years. Unlearn those things. Several things you have learned, you have adjusted to what men want us to do. We dress the way men want us to dress. We cook the way men want us to cook. We make choices because of men's needs, not our needs. We need to unlearn. That means those things that you have learned, unlearn them and pick up new ideas. Don't mimic men. Don't try to be like a man because you are in a position you want to behave like a man. No. Be independent minded. Learn about things that you can do to rebel against the dominant culture, rebel against men and the way men do things. And that is something that you need to use technology to do. Now, in some places, and this is very interesting, uh, of, 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 is controversial. People have gone on hiring and they have hired only, they say, exclusive to women hiring. They come here and say, we are coming to hire only women. So maybe the university one day say, okay, we are recruiting lecturers, but it's only women. We, are, we, are, we have enough men. And that is positive. That is progressive. We need to think about that. Maybe not today, but some of you are young. We have like young lecturers, young students, graduate students. Think about that. And creating the enabling ecosystem for them to come on board. But of course, get the men involved. If you leave us out, you'll be in trouble. Why? Because we have power. Men have the power now. That's why you have to use men as allies. Now you see, Dr. Kwaidu is in charge of IT. Can you sidestep him and go there and do things? No. So use him. When you get something, then you put him away. <laughs> you get the power. So, you can't exclude men. You need to bring men. Because men are in power and they make the decision. So use them as allies. You, I'm here. They have used me uh, for the last three or four years. I'm okay with being used. <laughs> as long as it brings progress. So they use me as an ally and have championed their cause. There are other people. I know that uh, Dr. Nanana has been here almost every time. Professor uh, uh, Ghani has been here. Uh, Professor C. Eduardo, every time he's been with them. Now, when you get such people, you have to use them so that you can bring progress. Now, women have already social media skills, use that. And then let's create the support and support telework innovation. That means distance work where women can stay at home and work and do a lot of things. Because you don't have the skills, when the job opportunity arises, you can't assess it. Because you, are, you, don't, you don't know anything about technology. You are just sitting there, then say, come and be a receptionist. No. Please, let us take the opportunity to learn. And the women leaders here want you to do it. Now, I'm moving to the last part of my presentation. I am taking on a different course. Gender equality in the era of artificial intelligence. There's something that is happening, which if you don't take care, it will wipe all the years of gender equality issues. And then we'll back to school, ground zero. These days, whether you like it or not, it is AI that is determining everything that we do. 
Yesterday, whilst I was working on this, I learned that students are even generating papers from AI. This time, not on Google. Because if you tell AI, I want you to do one, two, three, it will do it for you. Just like human beings. So, I just wanted to have a look at it and tell you how it's changing the gender equality dynamics. And that if you don't take care, we'll come back to square one because people's ideas have been put there and those ideas are now being recycled in society. So it's very important. And I'm encouraging everybody, every young person, every student, please, when you live here, go and read about artificial intelligence. Women, it is not for men. It is not anything mm -hmm -hmm. It is something very simple that you can understand once you are at this level. Go and read and see the thing that they can do for you and see how AI is also marginalizing you. Because you can use AI as a tool for empowerment, depending on what kind of information that is. So that's for those who are novices. I, I picked this definition from UNESCO. They have done some good work. AI involves using computers to classify, analyze, and draw predictions from data sets using a set of rules and algorithms. AI algorithms are trained using large data sets so that they can identify patterns, and those are mine. Identify patterns, make predictions, recommend actions, and figure out what to do in unfamiliar situations. So the thing that AI can do, you, the human brain, you cannot do that easily. It can make predictions. It can recommend actions. It can figure out what to do in several situations. Now, we need to think about it because the explosive growth in digital voice assistants such as Alexa and Siri. You see, it's so interesting that when people are, there are human beings behind AI, artificial intelligence, and all that happens that they, if you ask what information, there's a whole chunk of data all over the world. Then AI, by its machine learning intelligence, will go and select precisely or near to precisely what you want for you. Now, even if you say, if you say, like Siri, I want a tall, handsome, dark, glass-wearing man to marry. Before I realize, Siri has downloaded me. <laughs> And he say, here you are. <laughs> In a very precise manner, he's doing that. And we need to understand why this is happening. Now, let's look at something. Even though we interact with this on a daily basis, AI generated patterns, predictions, and recommended voice actions are reflections of accuracy, universality, and reliability of the data sets and the inherent assumptions and biases of the developers, of the developers of the algorithms and employed. So some people have developed it. So when you talk about gender issues, those who develop it, the idea they have about gender is what they will put there. So when you talk about gender equality, because there are a lot of things that are happening on AI, and people have started criticizing how AI is developed, even without women. Because already men are in, in, in engineering. Men are the software developers and writers of the algorithm. And the perspective, their perspective is what goes into it. And as I'm telling you, very soon, nobody will care about social media. Because you can speak to it and it will bring you whatever you want. You want a building to design for you. You want a nice guy to show you what night. You want to travel and say, this is the shortest route. And it speaks to you like a human being. So, if you look at the algorithm, even the first thing that you know, you get to know about the voice assistant is that they are all female voices. All the voice assistants are female. And that tells you about some subservient way of doing it. We are here to serve you. And it's not a man's voice, it's a female voice. But when you are not critical minded, you will think that, oh, it's something. Is a way of putting women in the margin. But women will not talk about it. Because so that even if you want to be AI job, they will say, oh, your position is to become a receptionist. 
And the voice assistants are receptionist boys, reinforcing what we do. So I got things that I have the potential to spread and reinforce harmful gender stereotypes. If you need to, uh, the young ladies, especially a young men, of course, because we want men as allies, please go and sign up to chat GPT and download and begin to read, know how AI works, and ask them questions. Now, when I signed up, the first thing I said, okay, let me try something. And I said, okay, what name do I give to my hard-working, beautiful and award-winning wife? Then first, he said, Betty Blue. I said, what do you mean by Betty Blue? Me, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm in Ghana here, and you are giving, you see? Because of the ideas, Betty Blue. So, what is Betty Blue? I don't know. Then I change it. Then the next time I said, happy um, looking, hard working, award winning wife. They said, joyful joy. <laughs> That's the response. I said, okay, joyful joy is okay, at least. There are people who are called joy and all that. But that's to tell you that the feedback you are getting is what the developers know. And so we need to understand that AI poses significant threat to gender equality because they are built in biases found in devi devices, data sets, and algorithms. So don't go there every time. I read a book. When I, I read, it's called Algorithmic Lab. Algorithmic Lab. Where everything that we want about lab, machines are detecting. So you say, oh, OK, uh, I, want to, I want a lava in Kumasi, then you tell me, okay, I can get you one, this, like this, like this, like this, based on your needs. That's it. So we are falling in love based on what machines are dictating, not based on what we want. So most of the young ladies, they go online, they are looking for Mr. Wright. That's what they call Mr. Wright. And the Mr. Wright that they are looking for is dictated by machine. <coughs> not what happens in the real world. And so AI is now detecting everything. And once AI is detecting, that means that our marginalization is even becoming wider. Studies have shown that with the coming of AI, previously they said that the gender gap was going to end in 99 years. We'll close the gap. Now it has reduced to, it has widened to 135 years before we can bring the gender equality. Thank you. You should have asked the lady to bring it. What are you doing here? <laughs> yeah, I don't understand it. Uh, all these young ladies there. You, this boy being, ah. I'm here preaching gender equality there. Who you, the man you are bringing me? I should have been told it away. Except that because I, I was dry, otherwise I wouldn't have taken it. <laughs> So the, the biases found in there are very, very important for us to know. So we ask ourselves, there are things that we say. Almost all data voice assistants have female personality and designed to be uniformly subservient and display gender biases and sexism. Now we need to understand that if we are going there, and I'm telling you that's the trend. So Please, if you're on social media, you put social media aside. And for about two weeks, go on AI, learn about it. It's easy to understand. The young ladies, don't allow the men to come and teach you. Go and read and teach them. And you see that all these things are there, and therefore, reliability is becoming an issue of concern. They need to discuss the negative and positive implications of AI for girls and women. We need to understand it. That AI is taking us on a new road, a new route where girls will be asked to do things that the machine has said they should do, and that thing is spreading or widening inequality. That's something that we need to understand. And, and I'm also looking forward to the time that most of our um, courses and curricula will include AI. In fact, if you start any new, any new course in AI, GTEC will quickly approve it. Last time when they were saying that we should move into that area. 
And that's why they have established STEM schools. Are you aware that we have STEM SHS, about five of them, just to deal with this issue? We can also start it here, but now, AI will affect gender equality, especially women who represent over 50% of the world's population. Because of the biases against us, because people are writing it, are writing with a dark, bias, and prejudice mindset, changing the gender equality dynamics. And if you don't take care, we'll come back to square one, because people's ideas have been put there, and those ideas are now being recycled in society. So it's very important. And I'm encouraging everybody, every young person, every student, please, when you live here, go and read about artificial intelligence. Women, it is not for men. It is not anything It is something very simple that you can understand. Once you're at this level, go and read and see the thing that they can do for you and see how AI is also marginalizing you. Because you can use AI as a tool for empowerment depending on what kind of information that is. So that's for those who are novices. I, I picked this definition from UNESCO. They have done some good work. AI involves using computers to classify, analyze, and draw predictions from data sets using a set of rules and algorithms. AI algorithms are trained using large data sets so that they can identify patterns, and those are mine. Identify patterns, make predictions, recommend actions, and figure out what to do in unfamiliar situations. So the thing that AI can do, you, the human brain, you cannot do that easily. It can make predictions. It can recommend action. It can figure out what to do in several situations. Now, we need to think about it because the explosive growth in digital voice assistants such as Alexa and Siri. You see, it's so interesting that when people are, there are human beings behind AI, artificial intelligence, and all that happens is that they, if you ask what information, there's a whole chunk of data all over the world. Then AI, by its machine learning intelligence, will go and select precisely or near to precisely what you want for you. Now, even if you say, if you say, like Siri, I want a tall, handsome, dark, glass-wearing man to marry. <laughs> Before I realized, she has downloaded me. <laughs> and he said, here you are. In a very precise manner, it's doing that. And we need to understand why this is happening. Now, let's look at something. Even though we interact with this on a daily basis, AI generated patterns, predictions, and recommended voice actions are reflections of accuracy, universality, and reliability of the data set and the inherent assumptions and biases of the developers, of the developers of the algorithms em employed. So some people have developed it. So when you talk about gender issues, those who develop it, the idea they have about gender is what they will put there. So when you talk about gender equality, because there are a lot of things that are happening on AI, and people have started criticizing how AI is developed, even without women. Because already men are in, in, in engineering. Men are the software developers and writers of the algorithm. And the perspective, their perspective is what goes into it. And as I'm telling you, very soon, nobody will care about social media. Because you can speak to it, and it will bring you whatever you want. You want a building to design for you. You want a nice guy to show you what night. You want to travel and say, this is the shortest route. And it speaks to you like a human being. So if you look at the algorithm, even the first thing that you, know, you get to know about the voice assistant is that they are all female voices. All the voice assistants are female. And that tells you about some subservient way of doing it. We are here to serve you. And it's not a man's voice. It's a female voice. But when we are not critical-minded, you would think that, oh, it's something. It's a way of putting women in the margin. But women won't talk about it. Because so that even if you want to be AI, 
job, they will say, oh, your position is to become a receptionist. And the worst assistants are receptionists, more or less, reinforcing what we do. So I got things that I have the potential to spread and reinforce harmful gender stereotypes. If you need to, uh, the young ladies, especially, and young men, of course, because we want men as allies, please go and sign up to chat GPT and download and begin to read, know how AI works and ask them questions. Now, when I signed up, the first thing I said, okay, let me try something. And I said, okay. What name do I give to my hard-working, beautiful and award-winning wife? Then first he said, Betty Blue. I said, what do you mean by Betty Blue? Me, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm in Ghana here, and you are giving, you see? Because of the ideas, Betty Blue. So, what is Betty Blue? I don't know. Then I change it. Then the next time I said, happy, um, looking, hard-working, award-winning wife. Then he said, joyful joy. That's the response. I said, okay, joy for joy is okay, at least. There are people who are called joy and all that. But that's to tell you that the feedback you are getting is what the developers know. And so we need to understand that AI poses significant threat to gender equality because they are built-in biases found in device, devices, data sets, and algorithms. So don't go there every time. I read a book. When I, I read, it's called algorithmic lab, algorithmic lab, where everything that we want about lab, machines are dictating. So you say, oh, okay, uh, I, want to, I want a lava in Kumasi, then you tell you, okay, I can get you one, this, like this, like this, like this, based on your needs. That's it. So we are falling in love based on what machines are dictating, not based on what we want. So most of the young ladies, they go online, they are looking for Mr. Wright. That's what they call Mr. Wright. And the Mr. Wright that they are looking for is dictated by machine. <coughs> not what happens in the real world. And so AI is now detecting everything. And once AI is detecting, that means that our marginalization is even becoming wider. Studies have shown that with the coming of AI, Previously, they said that the gender gap was going to end in 99 years. We'll close the gap. Now, it has reduced to, it has widened to 135 years before we can bring the gender equality. Thank you. You should have asked the lady to bring it. What are you doing here? <laughs> yeah, I don't understand it. Uh, all these young ladies there. You, this boy being, ah. I'm here preaching gender equality there with you, the man you are bringing me. I should have been told that way. Except that because I, I was dry, otherwise I wouldn't have taken it. <laughs> so the, the biases found in there are very, very important for us to know. So we ask ourselves, there are things that we say. Almost all digital voice assistants have female personality and designed to be uniformly subservient and display gender biases and sexism. Now, we need to understand that if we are going there, and I'm telling you that's the trend, so please, if you're on social media, you put social media aside, and for about two weeks, go on AI, learn about it. It's easy to understand. The young lady, don't allow the men to come and teach you. Go and read and teach them. And you see that all these things are there, and therefore, reliability is becoming an issue of concern. They need to discuss the negative and positive implications of AI for girls and women. We need to understand it. That AI is taking us on a new road, a new route, where girls will be asked to do things that the machine has said they should do, and that thing is spreading or widening inequality. That's something that we need to understand. And I am also looking forward to the time that most of our um, courses and curricula will include AI. In fact, if you start any new, any new course in AI, VTEC will quickly
quickly approve it. Last time Wednesday, they were saying that we should move into that area. And that's why they have established STEM schools. Are you aware that we have STEM SHS, about five of them, just to deal with this issue? We can also start this here, but now, AI will affect gender equality, especially women who represent over 50% of the world's population. Because of the biases against us, because people are writing it, are writing with a judge, bias and prejudice, it will affect 50% of the world population. Because women represent more than 50%. And we need to understand that these things are fundamental. We ask the question, who are the humans behind the algorithm? Should we fully rely on and trust the AI so that's the fundamental question that people, intellectuals and academics are asking. Who is behind? Who has written this? I'm sure that if you go and ask about typical African, you will get the stereotype. If you ask about a typical woman, you get the stereotype. Because the people who are designing the program design from a set of data that is already prejudiced, that already have biases in them. But we need to also understand that because AI is coming, you have to use it as a tool of empowerment. We can't say that we don't have to deal with AI, so we are encouraging our women professors to move there and write programs, to move there and teach people, to come in and tell us what we can do with the AI. Now, so finally, there is the need to better understand and activate AI for emancipation and women's empowerment for challenging norms and stereotypes. Because that is what is happening. You can't say, oh, we we'll go to AI. No. It is coming like a kind. And the earlier we embrace it, the better. So what we need to do is to go and find out how we can use it to change that. We can go and find out how we can become skillful in all the tech and all the data issues. So that as women, we can use it to break the quality. If you go there and you are writing, as you write, AI pick from all those that they started, and if three of us ask, I ask, what's an ideal African man? And then you see Michael ask, and that person asks, AI will give us different responses. They will never give you the same response based on how it's done, which means that they are picking. But whatever they give you will be ideal for you. So we need to understand that Without us making inroads in that arena and understanding how it works and suited, we can never have that. So, therefore, AI has the potential to make positive changes in our society by changing oppressive norms and ensuring gender equality. Thank you. Artificial intelligence for women, so <laughs> AI. So, as we have all heard the feminist gospel, according to Professor Andy of Brain Crime, I'm coming to sell myself and what I do. And I'm looking at all of you. I'm going to draw you in, and we are all going to work together. So, all the big men and the big women here, I already go to some people. I'm coming, Hada and I'm not stepping back. So watch me, look at my face. The name is Jennifer de Graaf Tineden. I'm reminding you. So, Prof talked about reciprocal group mentoring. And I am part of an organization called Embassia 4. And we have a new initiative that we call Empowered for Change Fellowship, where we are mentoring young ladies in the universities who have now identified their potentials. Usually, the questions you would ask yourself, what next after you see that you are good in this or that? So I'm coming to all of you. I'm coming, yes, I'm lobbying. He said it is not bad. So I'm doing that today. So that you help us groom and grow other young ladies out there. And I am an individual who is also into the empowerment of persons with disabilities. That is what most people know me for. Where on campus, we are training persons with visual impairments on how to use computer. So yes, we are doing a lot, and then I'm coming to you. That is what I want you to remember. So if you see me in your office, I need you to support whatever we are doing, and let's make the world better. He is the director of, the acting director of ICT service, and he is indeed in the right position and the capacity, and he has all the right to talk about 
the next topic, which is protecting the rights of women and girls in the digital space. Without much ado, help me welcome Dr. Ephraim Kwa Edu. Freedom of expression is also a shrine in our constitution. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, but I might make a few references to the law. Uh, freedom of expression is a shrine in our own constitution. And the right to work and education, so these are the rights that we're talking about when it comes to uh, human rights. Now, everyone is entitled to these rights without discrimination. And especially if we talk about 51% of our population who are women, they are also most um, entitled to these rights. In fact, if we talk about um, the disenfranchised, those are the reasons why we even have these rights anyway. So women are entitled to digital rights. So digital rights are basically human rights, but they are limited to cyberspace. And these are human and legal rights that allow individuals to use, access, create, publish digital media, and also to uh, enjoy those spaces like social media and so and so forth, WhatsApp, Facebook, and so and so forth. So these are rights that um, um, we expect women to to use. Now. They must be fairly entrenched, either through law or policies or whatever else, so that we can protect uh, the right of women to go online and to have the, the, the right to also post. It's not unusual that you find people posting online on Twitter and then they will be trolled. In fact, I think ProVC made um, uh, some pointers in that direction, where people, women go and post things and then they are taking on for uh, um, saying one thing or the other. We'll, we'll get to a few of that. Now comes to bullying. Now, bullying is um, aggressive behavior which must be intentional and it must be repetitive. Now, let me just take uh, just two minutes to explain what I'm saying here. You're talking about um, aggressive behavior towards another person. Now, I'm not talking about a case where somebody is um, annoyed you and you became aggressive for, you know, five or ten seconds, and that was the end of it. We all get, you know, irritated at some certain point in time. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about an intentional decision to be aggressive repetitively towards somebody else. So that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about bullying. And it also comes with what? An imbalance of power. So bullying has to be intentional. It has to be repetitive where you are exhibiting aggressive behavior. So that is what we're talking about here. And it also involves mostly an imbalance of power. Now, uh, if we talk about imbalance of power, we are not talking about somebody who is a manager and then uh, a cleaner or something. No, that's not what we're talking about. Imbalance of power can come in various ways. For example, those of us who, who um, uh, went through the old uh, system, you go to Form 1, you are 12 years old, and there is a senior who is in upper six, about six, seven years ahead of you. So you are 12, the person is maybe 18 or 19. And you see this person as a big guy, and you are this little boy here. Uh, in the olden days, they used to have something called middle school. So the person probably went to middle school for four years before coming to Form 1. So he's six years or seven years ahead of you and also went to middle school for four years. So the person is 23, 24 years and you are 12. And the guy has a big beard and you have never even grown a beard. And somebody like that has a lot of power over you because he's physically big and you see him as an older person who has experience in the school. And Trust me, those who went through that system know that there was a lot of bullying, even in the university. Okay. 
So the person could be physically bigger. He could be stronger than you. And so you could be the skinny little kid here, even with your mate who is bigger, and he can bully you. Or the person could be operating in a group, and it's not unusual to have uh, groups of people who um, deliberately bully other people because they are in a pack. And I'm sure most of you have experienced that kind of thing. There could also be uh, some level of perceived popularity. The guy is a popular guy here, so basically he is king. So when he says anything, everybody supports him, and so you are, you are the, the one at disadvantage. Or they might also have access to certain embarrassing things about you. So you dare not speak. Maybe when you were in school, they were calling you something, and the guy knows that. So if you say that, I will release that nickname here in the university, and your life will be miserable. So immediately you see the guy in the boss. I I'm sure you've seen this, this scenario. So that is what we refer to as, uh, you know, imbalance in what power. Now, bullying could be direct. The person is standing in front of you, you're bullying the person, kicking or you're punching the person. I remember when we were in school, um, in the night you find the seniors call us and say we should provide. So the little guy, the sister that you have, you have to go and bring it. That is direct. And you dare not have sister that is too hot. I remember one of my friends was made to eat a bowl of shito that she, he provided to the senior because it was too hot for Gary and Shito. You know, so that is direct, face to face. Okay. Or it could also be verbal, where people say certain things to you. Okay. And it could be direct. And there's a lot of indirect bullying going on, and I probably you might not have noticed. But people bully other people through uh, an indirect route. They let other people do the bullying, but they are the ones behind instigating the bullying. Okay? Or it could also be what? Relational. I'll explain this to you in the short. But we should also not lose the, uh, the sight of the fact that the effects of bullying can be long term and it can cause physical. And again, I'm not a psychologist, but I know that I've seen people who have suffered these things. And they had long term effects, either physically, socially, mentally, academically, or some kind of emotional uh, um, dysfunction well into the future. So, what do we mean by fiscal bullying? It could be that the person is hitting you, hitting you, pushing you, or you're coming to pass by and he trips you and you fall and everybody's laughing at you. Or he's hitting you. You shout and they say, Why are you doing all that? Why are you shouting? So, actual fiscal, um, or they even damage your property. You are holding books and they hit it from your hand and it falls on the floor. I remember when we were in tech, uh, you go as a first year student and they will let you sit on the pond and you have a round wet bum. If you go to your room to change, you come back, they will let you sit again. So you have to go walk all the way to Mecca with your wet round bum. That is obviously bullying. And most of the time, we, you know, um, uh, Provisi was talking about internalization. We see these things as a joke, or, oh, just a little bit of homo, you know, something like that. But in reality, it is what? Bullying. Then you also have verbal bullying. And this comes in the form of insults, you know, talk, name calling. And the women, especially, you're walking on the street and Somebody is shouting, Coco, Coco. You've all heard that, isn't it? Coco, Coco, they are banging uh, plates. Or they are whistling. You know, they are shouting certain things about you. How many of you haven't experienced this? Sometimes they would just assume that, oh, it's just a little joke. I don't think it's much of a joke. It's bullying. <laughs> Relational bullying, and let us uh, probably take a bit more time. That is uh, also referred to as social bullying. It involves hurting someone's reputation or relationship. And so you might say things about somebody behind the back to a group, and we all see the guy as, or the girl as um, dysfunctional in a way. Or they might even exclude you from that group. Okay, that is what you refer to as uh, relational or social bullying. They spread rumors, 
they exclude you from the group, we are going to eat. They say, oh, I'll come with you. No, 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 you stay here. You can't come with us. We don't want anybody who looks this or does this to come with us. All they tell people not to be friends with, this guy is a witch. Secondary school, that thing happens a lot. He's a witch. In the night, he's flying around our dormitory. So if you are eating, he shouldn't look at your food. If you've seen those kinds of things before, that is what uh, relational food or embarrassing people in public. There's a meeting and then you embarrass somebody in public. That is relational bullying. Now, girls tend to use relational bullying more often than boys, especially in high school. Now, um, I'd like to, to state here that bullying is not always a case of maybe boys against girls or girls against boys. You can also have women bullying women and men bullying men. Okay? I'll show you some statistics shortly. Now, cyberbullying is the use of data means to repeatedly do any or all of the following. Making threats online. Spreading lies or rumors. Sharing embarrassing photos. Um, WhatsApp has come to improve the way we communicate with each other within groups and all that. But it's also creating situations where people can easily bully people or cyber bully online much, much more easily. Okay? So they share embarrassing photos of people, they send or post insults in a group, they harass or send mean hateful messages, encourage and engage in some kind of social bullying or relationship and relational or bullying. They also impersonate the individual to engage in all kinds of things which could include any or all of the ones about. Okay? So, the internet or cyberspace allows some kind of anonymity. So you sit behind your phone or a computer in your room somewhere and you can post a message without necessarily being in front of the person and telling that person. You have a wider audience and people might assume that, oh, it's just a WhatsApp post that I put, or I just posted on Facebook, or I just created a website and shared that image. People don't notice that those kinds of things create a lot of harm. Okay. Um, with the organizers, I was, uh, when I saw the topic, I said, this is a very morbid topic to talk about, a sad thing to talk about, where you are celebrating it. But I think it's a very important thing that we're talking about. About 21% of adolescents have reported being bullied in the US. And that is one out of five. That's a lot. 12% of girls aged 15, 15 year old girls, have reported being cyberbullied compared to eight. So 12% of girls have been bullied compared to 8% of boys. So obviously, when we start from the beginning, we know that girls are always at a disadvantage. I already mentioned that relationship or social bullying is what? More predominant among girls. And cyberspace is one key area where we do a lot of what? Uh, relationships or social interaction, especially on um, social media. Adolescent girls use online networks more frequently than males. And again, I guess we all agree. Facebook, we find that a lot of girls use Facebook and WhatsApp more than guys would generally. There's therefore a greater risk of experiencing cyber victimization online for girls than we can have for boys. Okay? Right. Um, there is a view that girls don't, you know, we always have this alpha male where a guy wants to be in charge. And there's a view that girls don't do that kind of thing. But like I said, girls engage a lot more in relational bullying, and so they can do a lot of that in that space, especially on, on cyber space. Now, in a study uh, in 2010 of middle schoolers, that's more like a high school people, 28.5% of girls reported having been cyber bullied compared to 16%, almost 10% less. Interestingly, 21% of girls have also reported bullying other girls compared to 18%. So those receiving the bullying are mostly girls. Those actually doing the bullying are mostly girls. 
family. <laughs> okay? And so we all do have a role as, as men, but also as girls, to ensure that this particular behavior is not um, encouraged. Okay? Because you find more girls doing it, and more, more girls also being at the receiving end. Now, women are unique. I, 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 I don't know if I even need to believe at this point. Women are mostly here, and they already know they are unique. We've heard a lot about that this morning. But we've heard about politicians who would say that um, they are judged sometimes even by the clothes they wear. I guess I could have even easily come here with a t-shirt or a, a, um, a lacoste. And many people wouldn't say anything. But if a girl came here with a lacoste, some old lacoste, it would probably be an issue. Or, yes, so you find that many, many girls are judged, even by appearance, in the first place. Okay? And so women and girls, uh, and girls are often targeted based on various characteristics. Like the gender, the fact that they are women, they are targeted. You talk and you're a woman, you know, somebody may ask the question that if you are in a patriarchal society where you are not even allowed to talk, the mere fact that you are talking and you are a girl is a problem in the first place. Okay? And physical appearance. I've had a lot of female friends who have um, shared their experiences growing up because they looked one way or the other, or one part of the body was either bigger or smaller or whatever. I've never heard a guy being bullied because he had a small you know, behind. You, you know what I mean? Yes. It, 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 you know, it would be very strange even to hear that kind of thing. But women are consistently, you know, described. Expectations of society. We expect women to look a particular way or to do a particular thing. Or I don't need to We need to focus. I, I can't die for you. Nobody has actually complained about that. But I'm sure if any of you tell somebody that I don't know how to drive to food, to a day after. Or, yes, you know, so there are various expectations. There are sexual orientation issues, race. Black women are even at the more bigger disadvantage than even white women. Okay. Religion. You're a particular member of a particular religion and it becomes, a, it becomes an issue, especially if you're a woman. woman. So women find themselves in a particular unique situation that makes them more susceptible to what? Bullying. And that's one of the things we should also uh, take into account. Now, um, I suppose that I've already explained that females uh, would normally prefer relational aggression or relational bullying. So I'll just quickly go. I want to quickly go through the forms that cyberbullying uh, takes. Global bullying. People would specifically make a blog to express their views, targeting one human being. At times, I can't understand. Don't you have anything to do in life? You do a blog just so you can target one girl and be posting all, only about that particular girl. And even online, we see those kinds of things. People posting just about a specific, you know, that is global what? Bullying. Then cyber bullying by proxy. So I want my WhatsApp group to bully. And, and again, um, education is key. I remember in secondary school at intercolleges where we were doing the Jama thing. Sometimes we'll be singing, and they are singing about a specific girl and describing one thing or the other about a girl. That is obvious bully. I'm, I'm sure you've all seen that kind of thing before. You know, yeah. So cyberbullying by proxy. I want my WhatsApp group to harass somebody. Then I post something about a person in that WhatsApp group, and everybody is up in arms. Now complaining about that particular girl. The people complaining have never seen it. They don't know whether it's true or not. But once I have posted in the group, I basically sublet the bullying function to those people, and they go around bullying, sending pictures, making memes, and so on and so forth online. So that is bullying by what proxy. Then you have stalk, cyber stalking. There is fiscal stalking. Wherever you go, people following you and trying to contact you. But there is also cyber stalking. You create an account here, the person comes to follow you. You shut down the account, go here, he follows you. 
you change your number, and next thing you know, somebody is calling you, and it's the same guy. It happens, doesn't it? And they are laughing. I'm sure they've heard it before. Or sometimes they didn't experience it. That is what cyber stalking. Then there's also cyber drama. People kicking up a fuss, an argument, flame war. You know, sometimes drama over nothing. I know a lot of the uh, celebrities start some kind of drama to increase their popularity. But again, people also start drama just so that they can cyber bully people. See? They discuss all kinds of things, which for me, doesn't even bring food on the table. Then harassment. Somebody aggressively trying to uh, contact you or message you, and online is much easier. You know, in my house I have dogs. So, <laughs> if you come to my house physically, my sister also has dogs. You can just release the dog and let it chase you. But if you are sending it online, I have the dog outside, but on my phone the message is going to appear. So it's even worse. Then cyber threats, some people refer to it as cyber terrorism. Okay. They threaten you or let you know that you are at risk of something. Something will happen to you because you said this, something is going to happen to you. So they threaten you online and even if you are going out, you are not so sure. Because they, they could even spread certain things about you. And so if you are going out, you are not sure that whether some people might end up beating you up. Then denigration, people might denigrate you or say things about you. I have a friend who is a relatively tall, female friend. Actually, not as tall as me, and I'm not that tall. And growing up, a person thought she was too tall. Really? I, and I made the joke, I said, no, Papa, you are not that tall. But <laughs> no, but you know, if you are tall, so what? You know. I don't see anything wrong with that. But people will let you feel bad about yourself. They agree you. And there is e-intimidation. There's actual intimidation face to face, but there's also e-intimidation, where it is done electronically in cyberspace. You know, so people intimidate you, you go on a platform and they will say things and try and shut you up, you know, in WhatsApp groups and all those kinds of things. So those things happen. Then exclusion. You are in a group, you want to join your WhatsApp group. And they say, this guy, we don't want her in the This girl, we don't want her in the group. They exclude you. I've seen cases of friends. Uh, something happens, and they decide to remove the friend from the group. Okay? They remove you from the WhatsApp group. They exclude you. And they will make you know that you have been excluded from the group. Nobody should add you to that group. That girl. Or exposure. Sending types of information about you to the outside world. Um, this is obviously quite related to what privacy. Everybody has a right to privacy. People might say that, oh, if you don't have anything to hide, why do you want to keep certain things about you? But the question I ask is this. Everybody knows that, I'm sure, everybody here has had a bath in the morning. Oh? Who, who did it outside? We all did it in the privacy of our homes, in the bathroom. You go into the, you are in your house. You go into the bathroom, you lock the door. Everybody knows you are having a bath. You know, with soap and water, there's nothing string there. But you still do it privately. It's not because you have something to hide that you want your privacy, but everybody has a right to privacy. And again, it's in our constitution. The flame, that is more like an argument. People would say, if you even type in um, caps or in red, then you are, you are, you know, shouting. Then grief, people stressing you up with certain types of information. They're sending you grief. 12 midnight, you are sleeping, they are sending you certain types of messages and trying to basically irritate you or stress you out. Okay. Happy slapping. You know, online comes with all kinds of strange terms. <laughs> the first time I heard happy slapping, I said, who can be happy if he slapped me? But basically, what they do is that they come and physically assault you while somebody is recording. And then they go and post it online with your reaction. Okay? Happy slapping. Strange, isn't it? Non-consensual multimedia bullying. I know of a case of a lady who was in church. The pastor says, close your eyes and let's pray. Which we all do. 
eye was closed, and somebody got attempting to take a photograph of her, so that you can post online to say, look at this girl sleeping in church. Very strange, but it happens. So people would take phot uh, photographs of some kind of multimedia, and, and we do it all the time. On what I'm now is very right. People, I remember there was a case where there was a lady cross um, on the Kapun canopy walkway. And she was scared, and she was actually being recorded by her own friends. And it went viral. Everybody saw that video. I saw it, I don't know from Adam where the girl is. But we all saw that video, which I thought was horrible, actually. So that is non consensual multimedia bullying. They call it impen, impersonation, impen. There are all kinds of terms these days. I don't know how the English language would be like in 20 years. Impersonation. So basically, I get your account or I get your phone and I send a message pretending to be you. Okay? Can you imagine me sending? a sexually explicit photo of somebody onto a church group from your phone. Hmm? That's what somebody's saying. But that is what impersonation can do. I got your phone, you were going to pee, you left your phone. I took it, downloaded some photo and sent it to your church platform. You can imagine the horror you go through. People would never believe it. You say, I am not the one who sent it. I've seen cases like that and sometimes they say, oh, go and delete it. And the people go and instead of deleting for all, they delete for themselves. And the thing is permanently there. And there are screenshots going around. You said you you seen that before, isn't it? Yes. That is horrible. Instant messaging where people are instantly sending you. I, there was a friend of mine who kept saying that people there was somebody sending insulting messages to her personally, and she doesn't even know who is sending the message. And it's been going on for two or three years. And I think it's horrible. Malicious code dissemination, where people would send viruses or vir uh, um, malware to your phone or to your laptop so that they can deny you from using it. I know you have to set, submit an assignment, and I find a way to infect your laptop with what? A virus. So that your laptop crashes by the time you fix it, the deadline is passed. It's a strange thing, but people do strange things, isn't it? Human beings are strange. Mobile device image sharing, similar to this, but then again, they would share it from your own what? mobile device. Phone and marketing list in session. So I go and join an explicit site, submit your email as you requesting to be a member, and they start sending you uh, those kinds of uh, advertisements, you know, from those sites. And at times, they might even publish a list, and your name is there. Meanwhile, you are not the one who has attempted to be a member of that site. <laughs> you know, sometimes I, at some point, I used to teach ethics. And there were certain things that I found also a little uncomfortable talking about, because I didn't know who I was talking to. I am not encouraging anybody to go and do that kind of thing. It's horrible. Sexting. Hmm? Sexting. That is where people send explicit images of people, of themselves actually, to other people. But then there are cases where people send those images out. So I have a, a sexually explicit image of a lady and I send it out to somebody else. Some even use it for what they call revenge porn. You're my girlfriend, you sent me the image when everything was nice, and now you found somebody nice and you dumped me, and I get very angry, and I publicize that image so that everybody will see. Strange. But people do it, it's called revenge war, porn. I might not like it, if I don't like it, I shouldn't look. Or, yes, but people would take photographs and post it out, now say that, ah, look at what she's wearing. This girl was say far, you know that kind of thing. That is what they call slut shaming. You know what a slut is, so they're shaming you, making you a 
last so they can see you. Okay. Then there's social media bullying, where people can now become your friend, send a friend request to you, you accept the friend request, and then they start posting things about you online to your friends. Okay. Truly. Uh, there, there's been many cases where people express their view and then they are trolled. Basically, very, they are harassed and very bad uh, uh, messages are sent about them online. And, and normally you find that those who do the trolls might even be older and then trolling, you know, writing very bad things about maybe even younger people. <laughs> then I shouldn't even have spoken about this without talking about VLC bullying, virtual learning environments. Even on LLSs in universities, you would find that people are posting uh, very unsavory messages about um, their college students, their courses. And of course, YouTube channeling. People can create a YouTube channel just so that they can post things about one specific person that they dislike. That is what is referred to as what? YouTube what? I think we, this is not an exhaustive list of cyberbullying uh, uh, instances, but I guess it's getting a bit too much. So let's quickly look at the effects of what cyberbullying. Obviously, and again, I'm not a psychologist, but you would find that people would suffer emotional distress, anger, frustration, embarrassment, sadness, fear, depression, at times, it might even interfere with their schoolwork or even with their, their employment. They can't go out and go to work. Some might quit their jobs. Some might drop out of school. At times, they might even get involved in delinquency. They don't go to school. They will join a gang so that they can also try and get their self-esteem back. Some might get involved in uh, substance abuse, drink, use drugs, and so on and so forth. The worst is where they commit suicide. I will show you a few things. August 8th, 23 years, was uh, an actress. Was thrown because she refused to do a pornography movie. So she was accused of all kinds of things. And she committed suicide at 23 years. Sad. Jaden Bell, 15 years, 2013, committed suicide because she had certain sexual preferences that people did not agree with. 15 years. Dan Chen, U.S. Army, 19 years, was bullied for being uh, Asian. Her race. 19 years, she committed suicide. He committed suicide. Uh, this is just a few examples, actually. Tyler Clementi. And most of you guys do it. Had sex in his room, and his roommate installed a webcam to record him. And so after that, he, just, he shared the video around with a guy who was supposed to be, uh, you know what I mean, straight, nice, and hey, is it the thing that this guy does in the room? They've shared the video around. 18 years, he committed suicide. This guy has Daniel Ruth, Amufa, 29 years, he committed suicide from cyberbullying. So, Cyberbullying is not like a harmless joke. You could really affect people and they could take certain decisions which are not what? Reversible. Now, what are the effects of the victim? Of course, grief might suffer. And, and as academics, at times you might find that our students might not be doing well. And they say, oh, we are gone. It might be that she's facing, or he or she is facing a lot of what? Uh, emotional problems from cyberbullying that you could easily deal with after season, throughout the dropping out. Okay. 
And sometimes it might even be a case where they might come to school with a knife or something. Because they are being bullied. Whether physically or, you know, uh, because if they bullied you and you think you might even get attacked on the roof, if I'm going to buy bread at Precious City, they might attack me. I might go with a, a knife in my pocket. It is very regular, uh, um, you know, decision. So it could affect what schooling. And as academics or as uh, lecturers, these are things that we should look out for. Those who have not been bullied, they are just standing by, watching the bullying. Or you are on a group and you saw people bullying another person. By someone. It also has an effect on them. They may afraid, be afraid to associate with the victim for the fear that, oh, this guy has been, this guy is a witch. Nobody talks to her. So if you start talking to the person, then you could also be accused of being what? A witch. Okay. Right. So that is one thing. Or if they even went to report, they could be accused of being what? A snitch. And they may experience feelings of guilt because they didn't do anything about it. Then of course, the police themselves. So the bullies suffer, the bystanders suffer, the bullied also what suffer. Studies have shown that um, in childhood, if they bully, it could be a sign that they have violent tendencies and delinquency and criminality. Actually, a study found that those who bullied had three or more criminal convictions before they turned 24. And so the bullies themselves, they think they can do anything and get away with it. I can steal somebody, something and get away with it. So, you know, instead of uh, uh, bullying now, this time I turn into arm robbing. Right. There are long term consequences. Monica Lewinsky, I don't know if anybody has heard the name before. Good. Monica Lewinsky had serious issues with even getting employment. And guess what? She dated the President of the United States when she was what? Uh, an intern. She was finding problems getting a job. The president never lost his job. That tells you who suffers more. Anybody, actually there was even a Ghanaian song with Monica Lewinsky name in there. And that lady didn't even come from Ghana. I listened to a number of interviews uh, over the years and to hear the level of suffering she went through, it's, it's you know, obviously not good. So let me quickly finish with what we must do to protect. There must be strong laws to deter cyberbullying. Laws must be passed and should explicitly. There are times where you can use maybe domestic violence laws and so on and so forth to handle cyberbullying. But we can pass laws specifically against what? Cyberbullying. Digital platforms, for example, our own LMSs, should have policies that prevent people from cyberbullying other users. Okay? So these policies must be enforced consistently and across board. Don't just protect men or what are children, protect everybody, including women and female lecturers and so on and so forth. Educational awareness is critical. I said that when we were growing up in school, we thought bullying was, you know, that was the norm, isn't it? It's because we didn't know better. Thankfully, I didn't bully much, actually. Just a little bit of a... But it's because we didn't know much and know about the effect. So again, I want to um, suggest to the gender mainstreaming directory to probably look at ways of educating the university community, including men and women, about the effects of cyberbullying. And I am sure there is a lot going on on campus and people are quiet about it. Okay? So education is key. Then there must be support available for victims. If somebody has been cyberbullied in, in Winnipeg, uh, UW, what does he do? I don't know. I don't know if any of you know what you have to do. So there must be support systems and it has to be publicized widely. So if you think you are being bullied, you know where to go and who to talk to. I know there is a counseling unit, but people might think that, oh, this one is for this type of you know, problems, not for cyberbullying. And again, it should be applicable to everybody. Everybody should have the right to. So, UW, we should have policies, we should have support, and so on and so forth. 
Fortunately, we are doing well with laws in Ghana. First, there was a domestic violence law, and I know a couple of people were convicted for revenge bonds. Um, there is the Cyber Security Act 2020, and this guy, Solomon Dogger, for example, was jailed for 14 years for the extortion. Um, he's a phone repairer, and a Lebanese lady went to send the phone for a pest. And he repaired the phone, downloaded explicit images of the lady, and was now asking the lady to pay before he gives the image back. Fortunately, the lady was raped, reported the case, and this guy was arrested in jail for what, 14 years. And I think it was a good thing. So personal, this is the last thing I'll say. Personal safety. I don't blame people who are being bullied, but it will also help if you also try to keep yourself safe. Stay smart on the internet, stay safe and smart on the internet. For example, use, don't share your passwords. Use strong passwords so people can get into your social media. You know, WhatsApp people are now taking over WhatsApp accounts and posting onto groups. So you remember in termination I spoke about earlier. It can easily be used against you. So be sure that your systems are safe. Don't share your home address. Don't share your location. I know ladies especially like to share all kinds of things. Oh, I'm um, Labadi Beach Hotel, enjoying myself and all that. <laughs> Isn't it? But it is not a very safe thing to do. Okay? Your telephone numbers. Oh, what's your number? Oh, there are two, four, four. Da, 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 da. Be careful who you are giving your number to. Okay? Email address and all those other things, all those uh, social media um, you know, handles. Be careful who you give them to. For me, most of my social media is very private. You can't follow me unless I allow you in. If I don't know you, I don't know you. Yeah. Accepting friend requests from people you don't know is not a very wise thing. But it is, I know on Instagram, the, the war is about how many followers you have. Isn't it? Yes, when you are putting yourself at risk. Be cautious about in person meeting. You meet people on Instagram and you want them to meet. Oh, say, oh let's meet somewhere here. Let's meet at the, the stage Friday night. You don't know the person. Be careful. Be cautious about anonymous messages. People will text you. They have your number somewhere detected. You know, be careful about responding to those kinds of things. So, um, I think my time is far spent. So, thank you very much for listening to me. Great. So, ladies and gentlemen, I introduce the next speaker, who is a very good friend of mine. In fact, uh, she's my partner in so many things. Ladies and gentlemen, she's a woman of power. I love her so much. She's a great woman. Very instrumental and dashless. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce you to Dr. Mrs. Patricia Ananda. Let's do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. The presentation is going to be very brief. I can see that we are hungry and tired. The pro -VC has touched on a lot of the things that I want to talk about. So the first part of the presentation, which actually wanted to focus on issues of equity, equality, access will be minimized. But particularly, I would want us to look at the real stories that we have as a university. So when we're talking about the technical ICT gaps, globally, then we narrow down to our context. Then the most important component of the presentation is going to focus on experiences of young women who have leveraged technologies to do brilliant things. So we have three people, two women, one gentleman, who would share with us the experiences regarding the types of technologies they have used, the journeys, the challenges, and how they've been able to sail through the challenges, and particularly the benefits that they have derived. And so quickly, we would want to 
globally, we know that economics have leveraged on technology. We have so many technological tools that the global world have leveraged on. And as Provisi said, COVID-19 actually was a precursor. And that even made us to understand the gap when it comes to technology used by women. So if those of us who were caught up in that dilemma would bear um, me witness, you realize that even during crisis, ladies would be suffering uh, to connect and so they would want their um, male counterparts to help them. So the COVID-19 actually made us understand the real issue when it comes to the gender gaps in accessing and using digital technology. And this, as the gender director mentioned, informed the choice of the theme for this year's celebration. So we know that we are guided by the SDGs. And as youths, we are supposed to create new and innovative solutions using technology. And that is where there's the need to bridge the gap. Because if we are moving together, then we should be able to hold our hands and move together in one direction. Digital technologies are rapidly increasing. They play significant roles, as already been touched on. And so depending on how you employ them, the type of tools that you leverage on gives you the outcomes that you get. These are the types. We have phones, we have computers, we have social media handles, and so on and so forth. We would want to brush through this, because we already know the inequality and the equity issues. So we don't want to focus on that. Particularly, let's look at the gender inequality and inequality in technology. Now, as we can see, globally, we have degree of access by women to ICT, and this is very low. So when it comes to computer programming, engineering, system analysts, and designers, we have just between 10 to 20%. The remaining 80 are men. And that is quite alarming, isn't it? Good. Most women are in the secretarial and, and word processing outfits. So like Dr. Abi said correctly, the only female in his outfit is an administrator. Of course, the previous one helped with password resetting and other things. But basically her role is just for, for secretarial. So you are typing word, sometimes Excel, the difficult aspects, you know, we pushed to the men. And looking at the representation of women of internet use in most developing countries, what is the percentage? Hello? Four. Is that good? I want to share this personal experience when I did a study in one of the departments of this university. I won't mention the name. And it was on using internet to look for relevant information for educational purposes. When I collected the data, you know the bio data, you state whether you were male or female, right? So doing the analysis, I realized that most of the female responses on the questionnaire pointed to the fact that the usage was quite low. And so to further understand in depth why the figures were low, I decided to do some kind of interview, one-on-one -on -one interview with some selected females. And interestingly, some of the responses pointed to the fact that any time they searched for information, they would waste time. For example, if they go to the cafe and spend 30 minutes, about 20 minutes they see chaff. So they are often not encouraged. So what they did was that they would rather pay the airtime for the men to look for the information and then they will share. So it tells us the 4%. And things haven't changed that much. It's still happening. 
And I think that it's quite alarming and we need to look at that. What are the gaps? There was a research that looked at science and technology researchers. And for the men, we have 57 as against 43 for Latin America and the Caribbean. Fortunately for Central Asian countries, we see 50-50. You go to Commonwealth of Independent States, and that is 43 against 57. Then most interestingly, Africa. What do we see? 31 against 69. And of course, as Ghanaians, we fall into this category. And that is quite worrying. And that is why we need to wake up as a country, wake up as individuals. Um, I think most of the things have, have focused on how we should be able to move along, men and women, and see how best we can help each other to bridge the gap. So of course, girls are often left out of the co-creation, design, and product testing technology. So when you look at software development, it's more focused on the men than the women. As a result, female users are often either not able to access digital products and devices, or they even don't see the reason to use them. And this means that girls engage less. That is obvious. In UEW, interestingly, it never occurred to me until I contacted the planning unit for statistics. Current statistics of ICT education students, level 100, we have 284 males as against 12 females. Level 200, we have 543 males as against 50 females. Level 300, 462 as against 40. Level 400, 340, as against 29. And when you come to the graduate level, we are all smiling, but it's sad, isn't it? We have 60, 68, as against eight. Hmm. Let's move on. When it comes to staffing, is it beautiful? We have 17 lecturers. Out of the 17, 16 are men. One is a woman. And this is real. Dr. Edu is a lecturer from the ICT department, a senior lecturer. And we were having a discussion this morning around that. I think it's something that we need to look at and see how best we can encourage ourselves. Why are these gaps happening? What are the reasons? And according to research, the reasons are more of encouragement issues. We are not encouraging ourselves enough as women. We think that there are certain areas that are not supposed to be ventured. And the men, the society, we are not encouraging our women. And we often also look at it from the pervasive gender roles. Um, Provisi mentioned home economics. Economics, the AMA, economics, then let's add the home and make it home economics because of the gender roles that we find ourselves. So these are issues that need critical consideration. And of course, attitudes. We have negative attitudes. Negative attitudes cutting through. From our own point, from the point of our men, our mothers, our fathers, sometimes the teachers who teach us. 
And so these are basically, according to research, the reasons. And it's not about aptitude. It's, it, it has nothing to do with intelligence. Because if we all bear in mind, women are often more intelligent than men. And research has proven that. True or false? Exactly. So let's work on ourselves and see how best we can pull through. How do we bridge the gap? Girls and young women need equal access to technology and digital training, like it was indicated, to be safe online. I think Dr. Edu advocated for the training, and I think it's very important. And I would admonish the director for gender mainstreaming to take this training up in the next few months so that we see how best we can encourage ourselves in that regard. There should be educational incentives for women. I think as a country, as, 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 as a globe, we should make conscious efforts to encourage women. So this issue of if somebody is interested, we shouldn't actually look so much at the point of entry for ICT, you should be able to get, say, a 14. We should try and be flexible when it comes to those requirements so that women can have a lot of advantages and opportunities to leverage. So female science and technology teachers should pose as role models. We should be able to identify. And um, we go to science. We didn't delve into the science, chemistry, and all those areas. But what we are saying is that we shouldn't only focus on our community as UEW. We should be able to identify other aspects, women, ICT aspects, to serve as role models. And on this note, too, I think I will still challenge our gender mainstreaming director to help us link up with some seasoned IT experts for this year, at least, so that we can make the things work practically. So I want us to just go through, of course, if we want to bridge the gap, we need to monitor the ladies who are into ICT, the progress, and see how they are doing. We need to identify benchmarks and then best practices, because without them, all these things we are talking about would not be able to yield any positive results. Now to the very important component of this presentation, and this is where the real stories are. But before I call on the individuals to share their stories, we have some young women who currently have been projected in the media for various brilliant work they are doing through technology. So we have the name. Zulaiha, mm -hmm. yes, he is the founder of Diva Lopa, and for her, she targets African ladies, especially Ghanaians, to venture into technology. So she mostly focuses on the hardcore technology issues when it comes to coding, web development, digital marketing. Then we have Barbara Dapa. He's a national leader and co-coordinator for Ghana Ladies in Tech. So what she does is she seeks to create a community of tech survey young ladies. She engages in transformative and entrepreneurial journeys. So if people have brilliant entrepreneurial and business ideas, she helps them to access technology through that. Then she also promotes businesses through technology. We also have Equia Issa. She is the founder of Girl Child in Tech. And her focus is on how to use the current new technologies. So she gives the young women the confidence to master new and virgin tools. We are now Okay, so one thing, one key important thing I want us to talk about. There are people who are using technologies to do various um, things, businesses here and there. 
I think Jennifer will be called, and when she comes upon to talk about her initiative and her NGO, Jennifer, we would want you to share with us how Comfort is encouraging young women into uh, businesses when it comes to the use of technologies. So the first person to do us the honors to share her experience, she's known up there, when I say up there, I mean in the space, tech space, as she, Jackie, says. With a round of applause, let's invite Jackie to share with us her experiences so far as the use of technology is concerned. I think we can do better, please. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Doc. And as she said, my name is Jacqueline Asumaya Boa, but out there, I'm known as she, Jackie Says. I'm a digital content creator for various social media platforms on YouTube and TikTok, and mainly I teach people how to edit videos. So it started um, when I came to the university. Yes, I completed here. I'm still here doing my master's in the School of Communication and Media Studies. So I started in um, second year in the university after I went in for Miss UW. So I still wanted to, I had a project when I started and I wanted to still um, reach out to young ladies out there. So I started a website and that was how come my name came about. Um, I brought young ladies on board and we were it was just writers coming together to put out content. But this time around, it was a written form of content on websites. Then later on, I started into a bit of journalism. Um, I quit. Then I went into actual content creation, which is on YouTube. Now, that is where I would probably say the breakthrough started for me. Um, it has been an amazing journey. I'll consider myself to be um, a YouTuber because my channel got monetized um, about two, three years ago, and that is where I generate most of my income. Even as a journalist, I feel I derive more from being a content creator and being a YouTuber more than even being um, a journalist out there. Now, the benefits, I think I'll still talk about it. Um, it has given me the opportunity to meet people that probably I never thought I would, and moreover, it has, been, it has made me to be an independent person when it comes to funding things myself. Starting graduate school, I made the decision to go to graduate school. Funding and everything came from myself. Um, starting everything with the content creation bits. Um, it was all through YouTube. That was how come I founded it. So sometimes I get people asking me, how do I go about it? I think it's all about um, putting your mind towards what you want to get and where you want to and um, what you want to achieve in life. Now, the challenges. So, um, dealing with the challenges. Now, personally, how do I deal with the challenges? Um, I've always seen myself as a go-getter, and nothing, sometimes I break down, sometimes I think of giving up, because um, you get to a certain point, you really need the help of someone, and the person would um, try and make you feel a little bit less of a person. So sometimes you wonder, maybe if you were a man, you would have probably gotten it easier because you would have gone to the person's doorsteps without the person trying to say, I want to sleep with you. I want you to do this for me before. So I feel as women in the digital content creation space or women in tech, um, how we can do away with a few of the challenges that I've said is that um, sometimes you have to be very focused, set your mind right as to what you want and know that it is not always about giving in to people's demands. Um, you can also make your demands as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that rich experience you've shared with us. We would want to invite our co-MC. Let's give it for her. So, 
getting the scholarship, we were told stories of how um, people were making impact in diverse ways. And I also asked, what can I also do? Because someone somewhere who doesn't know me believes that if they sponsor a girl like me in Ghana, she'll be the light of her world. And so I put it in my mind, let me shine. So coming to school, I had it in my mind that I should find something to do. And that is when I found the persons with disabilities in class, they are challenges and decided to do something about it. So that project is Beyond the Bro initiative where we help students with visual impairments learn how to use a computer. I am not, I wouldn't say I'm a tech tech person. When I started, people even used to laugh at me that I don't even know how to use a computer very well. I can't, you can't type so well. And you are teaching people how to use a computer. What are you teaching them? But there was a problem that needed a solution. And yes, we've carried on with it. And people have been very supportive. Going forward, we have been able to bring up another initiative. That is the children with disabilities in tech where we are teaching robotics, web development, and graphic design. It is a new project that we are launching through the support of the Chile's project at Plan International, where we are making sure that persons, particularly children with disabilities in school, get the opportunity to acquire some tech skills and then develop or build products that would be beneficial to them. They would make money out of it and, and then also be beneficial to the world because when we design with inclusion in mind, the whole world benefits. So we look at accessibility features on our phones where we are using Siri. It was developed with persons with visual impairments in mind, but now we all use Siri on our phones and other accessibility features. So that is what we are trying to do. Challenges, well, sometimes people will just try to write you off a the, by the, the fact that you are a woman, you are a girl, especially if it looks like you don't have the very basis for what you're, like, the basic qualification. A person reading political science, venturing into tech. A lot of people wrote me off, but it's about what you are trying to do and what you want to reach or where you want to get to. And the benefits, ah, oh, have benefited a lot. I've gone to places, I have met people, TV interviews, being published, even on the university website, standing here today, today to be the MC. It is one of my accomplishments, it's a benefit, it's a big deal. Yes, I'm seeing with Bismarck. I met, I saw Bismarck in level 100, when we came to level 100, he emceed one program. I admired the way he, he um, hosted the program, and up to now, I remember what he wore, because what he, how he, <laughs> his, yes, his delivery was that admirable. So for me to put myself out there, to be noticed, and to be called, to come and emcee this program, it's a benefit, it's a huge accomplishment for me. So what I would say is that, dear young lady, dear young woman, the world is yours to conquer. It is yours to conquer, I tell you. And then there are opportunities available. The challenges are there, but there are a lot of opportunities available. So look out for some of the organizations that focus on the empowerment of women. Comfort, Plan International, and then a whole lot more. So Plan International has the She Leads program. Comfort also, aside the scholarship programs, they have tech, um, skills training programs, so TVET, in tech, um, in different skills. Just search, make sure that you are searching right, you are following these organizations on social media, keeping your eyes on their websites so that when these opportunities are open, you don't miss out on them and you make the very best out of them and conquer the world. Thank you. Thank you. Let's conquer the world. The last person is a male. I intentionally added a male to share his experience because he has a lot of experiences, particularly when it comes to some of the things that the females experience, so far as what he does. He's a TikToker, and he's in the person of, he calls himself Kwame Pencil, with a round of applause. Let's invite Kwame.
Pencil. How many of us know him? Kwabna Pencil, you see? Let's give it up for him. Good afternoon. Yeah, due to the weather, I, I would like to speak cheap. Yeah. yeah. The, the weather condition. Yes. Um, I'm also Abuaje Solomon. Yeah, I'm artist. Yeah, popularly known as Kwabna Pencil. Yeah, I'm influencer, social media influencer, content creator, producer, and many more. Yes. Um, tell me, can I make a few? Yeah. Eh, yes, I say, yeah, I say, yeah, 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 so long, so what I say. Yes. Uh, started in the Yawo and Jumanima. Yeah, videos, me videos be be our one thing. Any other day, challenges be be new face. You go soon face. But why a Jumana channel day? On a boom, how basically I control challenges in any other day. Yes, a ban of challenges now as a bear, my dear. We are content creator. We have videos. We have your support. Who will be feel say like we hear so support too, but who also are all support too? No, we hear on us be demand the baby every day, every who. I say bear man die, I go here bear man, I go here see the any panel say be we here gay in every other person no here. Eh eh, one or two things be yeah, one for a dream man, but a more be one one be ano any eh. A man a man on society now, you will be able to have. Nemiji say or person or ye media we know yes, but how we see Asha as ye no a problem. It's ye na ye we ni muka kana ye umono ubi bet me aba o oh me feel say media no me die me mu and as a me de me home awa ube buame my bit me aba one thing ye bit me chat videos me adi ade a mani bi sane mani bi yede et ye ubu on swa or no baby but on shada em wow it's the enka eka mea enka mano we are good. We are good. And come a person gave you a mad year. Mamma, let me tell you, a massad year. A tick tock here, you see. A man be any jimpa, but Uboha, a moa, or person be born, but a man also person would take it that advantage, no, 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 so dear day. A divin you and a far home, and I'm a small more new trade with you. Ena saadi eno, ema anu pinsu, ena mususu, enge saadi eno, mo lemeti mo mo dodo. Yes, obe mo ho bo bi di emo, obo ane ha eno reply na e. Ni pasu me zina reply me e. Wow, like the moment abe saadi eno na amani pana fa ose oye low kakra. Eti kame pesi bi a opesi obi bo awa umu lemeti kakra. Yes, me mo lemeti mo saabe bi a se obe fa ulu. Yes, me so kakra meti me akan afamu. Adam dance. Thank you, thank you very much. I think we've had wonderful experiences from our wonderful people. We've come a long way. What we want to say, finally, that there's the need to fully exhaust the benefit that technology avails to our society. We are often concentrating on the selfies. You drive through the, the, the various roads on campus and you see ladies either doing the selfies themselves or photo shoots. How can we translate this into something else beneficial for us? Let's be smart. Let's think local, but act global. Let's try to brave to leverage on technology. You could see that the experiences shared by uh, the few people who came is all about brevity. You need to decide and be determined that yes, you can. And that is the only point that you can pull through. We have a lot of people, experts. We have role models around. Get in touch, get close. And let's see how we can support ourselves as women and men. Let's hold our hands together, pull through, and leverage on these technologies so that we can build a better future for ourselves and for the society. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I welcome on the stage the chairperson, Professor Lucy Atto. She taught me gender, my first year PhD. Let's give it up for her. She's a great teacher. Thank you very much. Um, you bear with me that we have a fruitful day. It has been so fruitful. We've learned a lot. And all that I will tell you is that so far as gender is made, gender is created, gender is formed, we cannot make it. We can reform it, we can transform it, we can change it. So all that we are here today to do, at least bear in mind that if for nothing at all, you can use your social media skills to venture into issues related to artificial intelligence. We have also learned from our colleagues who came to share their stories with us. Some started from nowhere, but they have made it. You are also capable of making it. So for us to make sure that we've done justice to today's program, let's continue to be focused on what we want to do, to show to the world that we also came. And as women, we are partners in development. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor, for that one. Ladies and gentlemen, vote of thanks. And to do that, we call Ishmael Abdul Fatah.